Good afternoon to you. I'm Jan Markowitz. My guest today is Nancy Stafford, and Nancy is going to be sharing with us uh, some of the things that God did in her life, and she kind of grew up with a little bit of a rough childhood, and I'm going to let her tell us all about that, but I do want to remind you that Nancy is, of course, an actress. She's an author. Probably will remember her from Matlock. That's where I remembered her the most, and she was one of my favorite actresses and just loved the program and glad to have her with me today, and she's going to be sharing the things that God has done in her life. So thanks for being with us today, Nancy. Thanks, Jan. Nice to talk to you again. It's always nice to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Now, I know growing up was kind of rough when you were a child. Could you tell us about that experience? Yeah, I think you and I had similar experiences. You know, Mm -hmm. childhood is tough anyway for everybody. And um, in a way, I sort of, you know, I, I didn't have abandonment issues. I had a family that was intact. I didn't have any of the majors that you think about as being a really hard, hard childhood. But I just happened to be wired by God to be an extremely sensitive kid. And I was just the most gangly, gawky, geeky, nerdy, unpopular, uncool kid growing up. And it was, it, it, those kind of rejections and ridicule and uh, teasing and taunting from my peers just went straight into my little heart Mm -hmm. and uh, really kind of started at six years old in a ballet class and I thought I was doing great and I was leaping around and one day the teacher and the kids and the parents actually in the back were all laughing and giggling and me and I thought I'm doing a good job they like my dancing and then I heard the teacher say the girls are doing so beautifully except for that little Stafford girl she's the most clumsy awkward child I've ever seen oh bless your heart And I was mortified. And do you know that what I heard was, you're clumsy, you're ugly, nobody wants you, who do you think you are to try anything? Mm -hmm. And that day, those lies lodged in my little six-year-old heart. And guess what I did, like so many of us do? I carried those lies all the way into my adulthood. Those were the whispers that I kept hearing throughout my life. Even after I blossomed, even after I started into this crazy business, first as a model and then an actress, still the insecurity and deep-seated feelings of inadequacy and unworthiness were masked by a picture-perfect painted-on smile. Mm -hmm. But deep inside, those insecurities and inadequacies really had a deep, deep hold on me until the Lord began to heal my heart. We can understand when you've gone through that. I went through a similar situation as a child, and the Lord tells us in His Word that we need to be careful the words that we choose and the things that we say to one another, because the tongue is like the worst weapon, isn't it? It, it, it just hurts and goes so deep, and it causes really it causes scars that you can't see. That's right. But scars that that person is feeling and, and dealing with. Speaking to a, a, a little one, a tender heart mm-hmm. um, of a young one, it's all the more important to... And in their defense, frankly, I mean, I'm sure she, she really didn't mean it as a terrible criticism, but I overheard it, and I heard it incorrectly. Mm-hmm. But that's the way the enemy of our soul works in many of our lives. Mm-hmm. We either perceive things wrongly, or we have had pain and woundedness, and then what happens is that lies form around all the wounds of our lives and we adopt behaviors that are damaging to us that we use to run to or to hide or to give us comfort or we develop uh, behavioral patterns you know kind of we become you know insecure and inadequate or we become you know superior we have a superiority complex or we we just develop aspects of our personality that aren't really us Mm -hmm. And it's when we come into that intimate relationship with the Lord that Jesus can begin to peel away the veneer that we've been, have been covered up with, and he can begin to peel away the mask of protection that we've been wearing for year after year after year. How did that affect you all through your school year when you were in school? Did it affect your grades? Did it affect how you did academically? No, I happened to be, I think part of my saving grace was that I was, um, I was always a great student and was in sort of accelerated classes. And so my peers in my classes sort of were just like me. We were all, we were all sort of similar. So we were all the geeks of school. Um, <laughs> So that didn't affect my grades at all. At least I had that that kind of comfort zone among my peers. I also 
was very involved in chorus um, and did all the musicals at school. I never would have been you know, auditioned for a lead role. I was way too shy for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, music and that kind of uh, expression in theater and musical theater and concerts was a great outlet for me. What point did the Lord come into your life where you truly understood what Jesus did for you? Did you grow up in church or was that a gradual thing? When did you truly come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Well, that's what's crazy. I grew up in a wonderful Christian home, and I began my relationship with Jesus when I was eight. And it was a very intimate and tender kind of relationship. Again, because he had wired me, he'd made me sensitive. Mm -hmm. The problem was I was overly sensitive to the outside world Mm -hmm. and the effects of, of that kind of criticism. But the good news is I became older, I realized I was also very sensitive to the Holy Spirit and to His love for me and, um, and how He desired me to live. But unfortunately, too, uh, by the time I got into high school, I started to get a little frustrated by some of what I thought was hypocrisy in the Church. And it again came because of my sensitivity and my insecurity. I had a couple of leaders and elders in my wonderful Church that were trying to help me, but they were saying, you know, you should be more like Susie over here. Uh-oh. Or if you could be more like, because they, they're trying to get me out of my shell. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't tell them that Susie was getting drunk after youth group every week, or that Linda, that they told me I should be like her. She had just told me she was now terrified she was pregnant because she'd been meeting her boyfriend in the back seat of his car. This was wacky because I was living my life. I just, all I wanted to do was be a girl that God was proud of and loved. I was just this really kind of pure hearted little girl. And I thought, even in church, I'm not enough. And so when I went off to college, I didn't make a concerted choice that I'm going to leave church. I just decided I don't need to go to church. It's just me and Jesus. We're fine. I'll go off to college 500 miles away, and I'll be fine. Well, you know (laughs) what happens. You know, suddenly you're that frog that they put in a, a pot of water and then slowly turn the simmer on until the frog boils in the water. He doesn't even know it. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that was me. And so for the next 15 years, I never stepped foot inside another church. And I considered myself still a Christian, but I was not living a life that was really reflective of my relationship with Jesus. And it took a crisis of faith, really, in my life, a major wake-up call that um, prompted me back to a spiritual journey again that eventually led me back to Jesus, but all of this took a very long time. 